1905, Albert Einstein wrote down what would turn out to be one of the most beautiful equations in all of physics. E equals mc squared. But Einstein was unknown at that time. How did he convince the whole scientific community that this equation was worthy of anything at all? Well, the answer is that he proved it. He derived it from the single hypothesis according to which the speed of light is the same for everyone. As it turns out, this proof is not that complicated. And in fact, we are going to be able to talk about it in a Science 4 episode. Let's imagine Sheldon with a double lightsaber with no ends. When he turns it on, two light beams go to infinity. Sheldon and his lightsaber therefore lose the energy E of the two light beams. Note that in his frame of reference, everything is symmetric. Therefore, there is no reason why he should move left rather than right. And Sheldon thus stays still. As a consequence, in all frames of reference, Sheldon's speed is unchanged by the lightsaber being turned on. Let's now add Leonard to the picture. Imagine he's first in the same inertial frame as Sheldon. Then, Leonard runs toward Sheldon, reaches speed V, then sees Sheldon turning on his lightsaber, and then stops in front of Sheldon. In his frames of reference, Leonard is the one who's not moving, and Sheldon will be the one that gains and loses speed. In fact, Leonard first sees Sheldon gaining kinetic energy, then losing the light beam energy, and then losing his kinetic energy. So far, so good. But, in Leonard's frame of reference, the light beam source is moving with Sheldon. Yet, because of the relativistic Doppler effect that Einstein derived from the hypothesis according to which the speed of light is absolute, this implies that the light beams will not carry the same energy in Leonard's frames as in Sheldon's. The light beam that goes towards Leonard will be blue shifted and will carry more energy, while the light beam that goes away from Leonard will carry less energy. However, overall, when we carefully add the energy of the two light beams, we end up concluding that the light beams carry more energy in Leonard's frame than in Sheldon's. Yet, the total energy lost by Sheldon and his lightsaber must be the same in Sheldon and Leonard's frames, especially given that they are initially and eventually the same frames of reference. Einstein's unavoidable conclusion is that the kinetic energy that Sheldon first gained must be greater than the one he later lost. But this sounds stupid, since we already said that Sheldon's speed V was unchanged by the turning on of the lightsaber. Yet kinetic energy is half of mv squared. So if Sheldon's kinetic energy before was greater than after, then it must be that Sheldon's mass decreased when the lightsaber was turned on. I'm going to skip the calculations here, but in the end you get this nasty formula above. What, what this formula says is that the mass that Sheldon has lost according to Leonard is going to be two times the energy of the light beam from Sheldon's viewpoint times this nasty thing. Now you can see that this nasty thing features the speed of Sheldon in Leonard's perspective. And so the mass of an object is actually going to depend on the inertial frame from which we observe it. But what's probably most interesting is what's going on in Sheldon's own perspective. Does he see his mass decrease in his own frame of reference? And to give an answer to this question, what we're going to do is to take the limit of this expression when v goes to zero, that is when Leonard's frame of reference is essentially the same as Sheldon's. And when we do so, we obtain this amazing equation, m equals e divided by c squared. And by the way, this is the real deal. It's the real equation. It's not e equals mc squared. Of course, these two are equivalent, but I think it's important to write it m equals to e divided by c squared because the meaning of this equation, the true message that it sends, is something about mass, not something about energy. In particular, there are a bunch of misinterpretations of this equation. You sometimes hear things like there's an equivalence between mass and energy, or that mass is a form of energy, or that 
mass can be converted into energy. Well, all of these sentences are actually quite wrong. Now, I'm not saying that they're wrong because I want to appear smarter than everybody else. Actually, there are people who are much smarter that do use these sentences, and I think it's okay to use these sentences if you're talking about uh, fusion or, or whatever, or relativity in general. But if we want to really have a grasp on this equation to really understand its fundamental meaning, I think it's very useful to realize that a lot of the saying that we usually use to talk about Einstein's relativity are not very accurate, or at least they're not what Einstein would say about his own theory. So what does E equals mc squared really mean? To understand, we first need to discuss mass. Mass, at least the one that Einstein studied in November 1905, is inertia. This inertia measures the resistance of objects to changes in motion, roughly. The inertial mass is then the amount of energy needed to add or subtract something like 10 miles per hour to an object. To illustrate, let's imagine me tackling French rugbyman Sébastien Chabal. Quite likely, Chabal will barely move at all while I fall crashing down. If I haven't been able to affect his motion, it's because Chabal has a large inertia. My entire kinetic energy was not enough to get him to back down. Conversely, my motion was completely stopped because my inertia is much weaker than Chabal's. Note that in this reasoning, gravity does not intervene. Everything I just said still holds if I am to tackle Chabal in intergalactic space. Besides, Gravity itself were to be completely reshaped by Einstein, as we discussed in previous videos. Anyways, what Einstein argues is that an object that has absorbed a lot of energy will gain a lot of inertia. Inertia is thus an emergent property of the accumulation of energy. In fact, what Einstein successfully determined thereby was the cause of inertia. Inertia was no longer a fundamental and intrinsic property of objects around us. It was now an aftermath of the fact that these objects are high concentrations of energy. So for instance, you might ask, where does the inertia of my body come from? Why is it that I have some sort of resistance to motion? So 98, 99% of my mass, of the mass of my body, actually boils down to this energy of the gluon field that my body, or rather the quarks of the atoms of the cells of my body, have been able to trap, to capture, to confine. Like the one person missing, this comes from the infamous Higgs mechanism that we heard so much about. But actually most of my mass does not come from the Higgs mechanism. The Higgs mechanism only gives mass to particles like the quarks and the electrons and the bosons uh, Z and W. But actually most of my mass does not come from there. Only one or two percent of my mass comes from here. Most of my mass is actually from the gluon field. It's actually the energy of the gluon field that the quarks have captured in between them. There's an awesome video about this by Veritasium, which I strongly recommend. And there's all, there are also the videos by PBS Spacetime on the topic, which are really, really awesome. I really, really recommend you to just go and check it out. And there's also the paper, the original paper by uh, Albert Einstein in 1905, which I strongly recommend to read because it's not that complicated, at least for a physics paper. And just to insist again on the true meaning of E equals to mc squared, just look at the title of this paper. It asks, does the inertia of a body depend on its energy content? And it's really a question about the nature, the origin, the cause of inertia. And probably the most mind-blowing thing in it all is that Einstein figured it all out just and only based on the assumption that the speed of light was absolute. Einstein is just so awesome. Hey, so I hope you've enjoyed these videos. I've been making 
translations of the videos like these in French uh, on the French YouTube channel of Science for All. So I've had to translate all the previous episodes and I figured out that there were some things that I did not talk about and that was worthy to talk about. So I've done these translations. If you are a French speaker, you should check them out. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to do another episode in English on special relativity next week about uh, Minkowski's uh, space time. And hopefully this will clarify some of the things that we've talked about about special relativity. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, uh, comment and share this video. And I hope I'll see you next time. You'll often see statements like mass is a form of energy or mass is frozen energy or mass can be converted to energy. That's the worst one. Unfortunately, none of these statements is quite correct. You can see that the change in mass of the cat must be equal to the energy of the light emitted divided by C squared or as you've heard before, E equals MC squared.